Hello, listener. It's a brand new week and a brand new Totally Football show and quite possibly an important one as well. Big things to talk about and doing the talking. Colin Miller. Hello, James. Uh, a big welcome back to Mark Carey. Hello, James. Hello. And Daniel Story from Leicester, from the Leicestershire. Nottinghamshire border, Nottinghamshire. thank you very much. Right. Yeah. Excellent. Did you enjoy your weekend, Daniel? Yes, I did. I was at uh, Villa Park and then managed to beat the traffic to get home. So I only missed about 10 minutes of the later game, which was perfect timing. The later game. Yeah. Yeah. Liverpool, Man City. What, what do we learn from this weekend, Colin? Is there anything that we can count ourselves aware of now that we weren't 48 hours ago? Uh, well, well, the title race is very much alive. Right. I think we can we can determine that. And mm. uh, yeah, the Liverpool City game, it, it felt like if one team had, the, had won that, you kind of think they've got momentum in the title race. They'll have a lead in the title race. But as things stand, there's only one point between those three teams, including Arsenal. So yeah, there, there hasn't been any hasn't been any solutions, but uh, plenty plenty still to go. It's ten ten rounds matches, thirty points to play for still. So it really feels like this could go the distance. Good Lord. Beyond the top three, Mark, was there anything that caught your eye? The resurgence of some of the teams down the bottom, perhaps? Yeah, I, I still really want Luton to mm. to do well. I know that they uh, they drew in this this weekend, but uh, I think they've of all the teams who have who have come up, I, I think that they've just got enough about them to to we we we've seen how much that they've they've got a little bit more about them than Sheffield United and Burnley, and the the, the way that they play with everything that's happened this this season for. For the squad and, and for particular individuals, I I really want to see their their story finish for this really strongly in the Premier League. Okay, Daniel may not share your warm feelings <laughs> towards Sorry, the Hasses. Uh, all the bottom three, in fact, getting a point this weekend while Forest lost, and with the week that might be coming up for Forest, it could all get quite dramatic. We'll get onto all those kind of issues very very shortly. A quick check on uh, the results on what was match day twenty eight of the season. Lunchtime Saturday saw Man United beating Everton 2 0. Palace, a little bit later on, conceded yet another late goal in their 1 1 draw at home to Luton. There was a late goal as well at Bournemouth, which saw Sheffield United missing out on what would have been a remarkable away win uh, to the Cherries. Wolves beat Fulham 2 1. Same scoreline for Arsenal at home to Brentford, which put the Gunners top of the table. Sunday, Spurs went to top four rivals Villa and won. 4-0. West Ham had to come from two goals behind at home to Burnley to take a point. Brighton beat Forest by a goal and yes, Liverpool Man City finished 1-1. Top of the table now reads Arsenal top from Liverpool on goal difference alone. City just a point behind. Woof. Let's begin with the action at Anfield. It was a match which saw City begin in magnificent fashion swarming forward repeatedly. You'll have missed that bit on your way back from Villa. But then Liverpool settled and seemed to be dominant. But then came the remarkable opening goal from Man City. Mark, I know you were a fan of that set piece routine. Yeah, I just think it's it was very intelligent. I know that Manchester City have got um, a couple of really good analysts uh, and coaches who who work really hard. And you could see uh, on the replay, you could see Pep Guardiola look to to the analyst and point directly at him. Which I always like those sort of moments to be like that was one that's straight from the training ground and. Uh, I think as much as anything, there's there's a few things that have to go into the goal actually being scored there. There's obviously the the idea behind it, everything on the training ground, but the actual execution. There's few players who can play with that precision, that much pace. I thought that the ball had gone out because to get kind of whip and pace on it, yet still keep it in from a corner was, was incredible from Kevin De Bruyne. OK, so Kevin De Bruyne takes the corner and catching everybody, I think, uh, unawares... Uh, Nathan Aki blocks uh, McAllister. Yeah, it was. That's the thing. It's such a great choreographed routine because the space is opened up for Stones, and you think, how has he got that much space? It catches everyone by surprise because of the way that De Bruyne plays it. But it was very intelligent from Nathan Aki just to to drag uh, McAllister with him. And I think that there was a talking commentary about maybe there being a foul in that. I think it was just very clever play. There's all such incredible choreographed routines now for for all different set pieces that a lot of people are analysing this season and spotting. And I don't think that would be anywhere close to 
to a foul, but he was very, very intelligent the way they did it. I mean, a brief parenthesis, there was comment on social media comparing it to the Endo involvement in the goal that was called back in the, what, League Cup final. But the difference there was that it wasn't the action that was illegal. It was the fact that it made him active in an onside sense and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Anyway, here, is there any likeness between this and the quick corner that Trent Alexander-Arnold scored in that famous game in the Champions League? Interesting question. Uh, I think the speed of thought, it was it was far more incidental. I think the Trent Alexander-Arnold one, obviously, is infamous for completely different reasons. I think this one felt very much, yeah, choreographed, very, very intelligent in doing so. But it, it felt jarring to watch because we don't tend to see many like that. We're always expecting, if it's going to be played on the ground, it's a, it's a short corner, it's going to be played pretty much outside the box. But to be drilled across the floor and it reach the near post, very much in the six-yard box, um, felt odd, but... You've got to just give good credit to Manchester City. Mm. Yeah, and it, it it feels like set pieces have become so prominent this season and you talk about set piece coaches and specialists and how hard they work, as Mark said. And you kind of think there's been how many thousands of corners have been taken in the Premier League alone. And yet this is something that almost felt a little bit unique in terms of Liverpool's structure and setup was right. But they just weren't expecting that exact placement and the exact movement of Ake and then Stones coming in, obviously unmarked. And that, that, that made a big difference. And Liverpool have been so strong themselves from set pieces. And like you, you look at the open play and the chances they create. But for all the teams in the title race, they really... Well, maybe actually City, it's maybe one of their... I wouldn't say a weakness, but maybe they're not quite the level of Liverpool and Arsenal in terms of converting them. But they're just so, so important, those small moments and even... Obviously, later in the game, and Liverpool go on and equalise. It's almost like it's 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 that one small moment of a of a mistake or a lapse of concentration, and maybe maybe that was the case for City's opener um, as as well. So yeah, it was it, this was a match that I think I think had Liverpool have scored first with with the, 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 this the crowd behind them. We all know what Anfield is like, and we even saw with City holding on at the end of the match. I think City might have really struggled to come back from a goal down had this have happened so I think it was important that they took advantage of that early phase of good pressure and we all know Pep Guardiola loves control whereas Klopp maybe thrives off a little bit more of a chaotic field of the game and I guess you kind of saw that with the ebb and flow for the first sort of half an hour certainly City had that control but then as Liverpool kind of grew into the game and spaces started to open up the more you thought yeah there's there's at least a, there's at least something in this for them and yeah, it's it's that clash of styles as well that has sort of defined this Guardiola and Klopp rivalry, isn't it? Just uh, like which like it's kind of had that back and forth throughout the years, and I think this game maybe um, antipified that a little bit. Their, their record away at, at Anfield isn't the best, City, but against a Liverpool side that had so many new faces in it. A remarkable stat on the Athletic actually: uh, only five of Liverpool's eleven had actually even started in this fixture. Before and given the way uh, City had started, Daniel, were you surprised that having taken the lead, they didn't push on with it? Yeah, I thought they were a little bit too chaotic towards the end of the first half. Actually, I thought they were going to try and uh, just kill the game at that point. And look, the the the, the Liverpool goal comes from a, a a foolish mistake from Nathan Ake. He did well for the first goal. He he kind of overshadowed that for the second. Um, and at that point, I suppose we should credit them for staying in the game. But I've not seen a team take Manchester City to the edge like that in a long time to really leave them almost kind of... I know they, they still tried to attack, but they were basically happy from a point from the moment they conceded. And Liverpool had those tails up. Luis Diaz did miss chances. I, I think Liverpool may well come to regret those. But I just thought that intensity that they had, given the new players, given... Um, the kind of uncertainty over conceding first and there was a sort of momentary lull at Anfield and then they went again. I thought they were spectacular second half. They they deserve to win the game, I think. Although, funnily enough, in the second half, it, it was City who went closest, perhaps, with those two shots that came back off the the, the frame of the goal. The the Doku one in particular looked looked certain to them. The, the Doku one, yeah, I think, again, in commentary, it was, it was said that there were centimetres in it, which is... Mm. The way that title races have gone in the past, inches, millimetres, centimetres. So that's potentially not surprising in the grander scheme of things. Um, then the, there was a fantastic save from Kelleher uh, against Foden. That was the second half as well, wasn't it? There was, yeah, potentially some sucker punches despite Liverpool kind of making the game more transitional. To, to your point, Colin, that it, 
if the game is is emotional, transitional, then it's it's Liverpool's game. If it's calm and if it's controlled, it's Man City's game. And I actually looked into the numbers on it. And in the first half, Liverpool had zero direct attacks, which is a metric as a proxy of counterattacking. So their game is built upon transition and that up and down, mm. uh, you know, type of game all season. And Man City reduced them to to none of that in the first half, and we we saw as much. Um, they had five in the second half, so mm. <laughs> significantly different. Um, and you know, again, as as Daniel said, I think that that Diaz one in particular, if he had just he opened his body up too much to try and get a bit too much curl on the ball, and he didn't need to. Um, if he'd have scored from that one, you know, that would have been the first time Liverpool were ahead game potentially becomes even more transitional but as City go and chase the game and then yeah, who knows it's all ifs and buts and maybes now isn't it mm. he was put through by Mo Salah who'd come on uh, Andrew Robertson as well brought on a bit of experience there is there a case that Liverpool were actually better before Klopp made those changes I think there was a there's certainly an argument that they had built up ahead of steam with the players on the pitch. It, it, it looked like it was always going to be the plan to bring on Salah and Robertson, so they shouldn't have been surprised by that. I think there is a tendency sometimes when Salah comes on, particularly as a substitute, and it doesn't happen very often, that there's this like, right, we're obviously going to get him the ball. So it makes them slightly more one-dimensional in an attacking sense. I think City kind of know that it's probably going to filter out to Salah pretty quickly, so they can sort of predict that. But then all that does is create more space for... Luis Diaz and you know the other players on the pitch. So um, yeah, as I say, I thought I thought Liverpool were excellent. I think if they'd have won the game three one, even with the chances City had, it wouldn't have been a huge shock on the basis of chances. I also think you know I'm not normally the one to bring up refereeing. I, I thought it was probably a penalty at the end. I can completely see why it wasn't overturned, but it was a high boot and he he was kind of he did catch him. I mean it's not we're not talking Nigel De Jong in a World Cup final here, but he he has his foot up and he makes contact with the man so. I do, I do think as well that the, the Salah coming back into the team, and obviously Mo Salah is Liverpool's most important attacking player. We all know that, but Liverpool have so many players out injured at the minute, mm. and the kind of young players and maybe the backups have come in have done really, really well, and that's that's a big challenge. I think in the final what six, seven weeks of the season is that selection between bringing players back in who might not necessarily be a hundred percent match fit or certainly match sharpness. And then phasing out the guys who've done well, and that that's almost that's almost like a problem in itself that you might not have thought about. But how how will how will Klopp do that in terms of the selection process? Obviously, it's a, it might be a good problem to have, but that's the thing, isn't it? That they've had a team who's who's kept changing it, yet is still finding ways. Okay, maybe not today to win the game, but certainly to get a to get a pretty a pretty okay outcome, I suppose, in the end. But I think in terms of this match, you look at the top three teams have played forty two home matches between them. The only defeat was Arsenal against West Ham, funnily enough. So that was the one outlier. Each of these teams has such a strong home record that home advantage in these games seems to be almost more important than, than ever. And especially with, with City's record at Liverpool, where, which is really, really quite poor. Um, the, the one victory was in that COVID season when I think Liverpool had lost maybe six or seven home games in a row in that, in that run. And that was that was certainly the outlier. But, but City's record here is poor. And this was always the fixture you kind of thought if City aren't going to win a game, it would be at Anfield, right? No matter, no matter how many players Liverpool had out injured. So you see this as a two points drop for Liverpool? Well, yeah, I mean, look, Liverpool had a lot of absentees, we know that. But I think looking at, at the, the game, starting in the second half, Liverpool had the chances to win it. Mm. And had Liverpool have won that, they would have opened up that small gap at the top. And the thing is as well, we've got three weeks until the next round of games in the Premier League for these teams. So three weeks is a long time to sort of sit in that. Mm. So I think had Liverpool have won that, you kind of think, yeah, this is now Liverpool are favourites. But they, the way things are... They'd prefer to win it, I'm sure. But I, I wonder if they, again, the way that the game began, they'd be, are they happy with the point? I don't know. Mark, what do you feel the significance of this game is? I mean, it ebbed and flowed so much that I think at different points within the games, they would have shaken hands on a, a draw and then maybe wanted to go for the win. So it's it's hard to say. What, what I would say is that Man City have got some really difficult games coming up. And that will obviously be a, a crucial few few weeks for them, you know, in a, in a couple of weeks' time. But Liverpool have got a really, really difficult end to the season. So it makes me think, to, to your point as well, Colin, that if they were going to maybe build up a bit of a gap, 
now and in the next couple of weeks, that's the time to do it because they'll probably be dropping points potentially in the final couple of games in the season and they'll want that buffer rather so that they can sit a little bit more comfortably um, rather than have to rely on other results going for them. But every every team in the top three do have difficult games and let's not forget that. Mm. I, I, I think, I mean, I know they're kind of vague narrative for the game or and maybe even afterwards it's kind of good point for City but I, I think it's a I think it's really good for Liverpool I think they they do have a good run of fixtures now they don't play another team in the top five till May so they have got I know one of those exceptions is is Manchester United away which is a, a fixture that comes laced with you know various neuroses at times but they're better than Manchester United and I think they'll probably beat them they they can quite easily win seven or eight in a in a row now Liverpool and if they do that with the games the other teams have got I think they I think they will have a a gap going into the final two games of the season to answer more, Mark's point about they have got hard games at the end of May they absolutely have they've got Tottenham and Villa in the I think three of the last four games or two of the last three games but if Liverpool have got a two point lead with three games left and it's Klopp's final three games of his reign and he's going for a title. I just don't see any way that they don't have enough kind of emotional heft to get them over the line. So I think they'd much rather have it that way. But try and build up a bit of a lead now, hope the Man City draw with Arsenal, and then kind of push on. We can all look at these fixtures and be like, that's a game they could drop points. But Liverpool needed, what, a 99th minute winner against Forest. Arsenal needed mm-hmm. a late winner against Brentford. Like these, these games, especially at this time of the season, when there's that little bit more pressure things can tend to happen so it's 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 difficult to, to look at it in that sense I think mm. so City Arsenal coming up in two weeks time before that City have Newcastle in the FA Cup Kevin De Bruyne who although this was a game which lived up in many ways to expectations his performance perhaps didn't Pep took him off how interesting was it the fact that not only did Pep kind of indulge Kevin's grumbles as he left the field of play, but then also felt the need to go up and sit with him and explain and put an arm around him and generally by, took his way out of trouble? Yeah, it was quite nice to see that they ended up just amicably agreeing that there was... I mean, it's because the stakes are just so high, isn't mm. it? That it's. I feel like from what I saw, I didn't hear it obviously, but it looked like... Guardiola was almost trying to identify something to say, well, I think this needs to change and this is why I changed it. And I think De Bruyne was like, I know, I thought the same and I was trying to change it on the pitch as well because there's very few players who are more intelligent at football uh, mm. than, than Kevin De Bruyne. So it felt like he was trying to find solutions himself rather than it's maybe in the modern day. Some players aren't always the, the problem solvers themselves. It's often uh, on the manager to do so. But yeah, I, I don't think he had the worst game. Um, I mean, even just for moments like his, his corner. Well, of course, is, he did enough. set up City's goal. So. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I don't think he had the worst game. And I think that if he'd have been kept on for, you know, for the duration, he would have still done something and mm. produced some sort of magic. But, you know, he is ultimately still coming back from... I know that he's played a lot of games, you know, the past few weeks, but he is still ultimately coming back from... Uh, from injury and the game was hugely intense it, especially in that second half as I say it was so transitional and the last thing you want is Kevin De Bruyne then pulling up and then losing Ooh. him for the for the final final few months of the season true this is hypercritical of Arsenal but I was at Bramwell Lane on Monday evening and they were 5-0 up at half time against Sheffield United they are now 7 ahead on goal difference of Liverpool who still have to play Sheffield United at home as well as some other gentle fixtures. At the time, I thought, why are Arsenal not trying to score three or four more goals here and get a kind of an insurmountable points goal difference lead? Because they haven't got that now. They've got enough of one, but having only squeezed past Brentford, it's it is surmountable. I just wonder if maybe they regret not pushing harder second half against Sheffield United. Mm. All right. Well, also, if that's the dif- if, if that's the difference in the title race, it will be an amazing two and a half months to come. Well, fabulous! It is plus seven on Liverpool Arsenal's goal difference, which is. Uh, not bad. And plus 11 on Man City. Mm. But in the meanwhile, other things took place this weekend. Let's get on to some of those next. Also on Sunday, Aston Villa hosted Spurs in a game labelled the most important in Villa's recent history by John McGinn, who proved in many ways a key figure in the way this one turned out. Daniel, you were there. I was indeed. It was a, yeah, it was a very bitty disjointed first half of which I'll make no further mention but Tottenham were were spectacular after the break they kind of identified I think in the first half they they were worried about Villa's home record and goal scoring and then by half time they realized there wasn't really anything to worry about Ollie Watkins looked 
pretty rusty and got a knock early on, I think. Leon Bailey was awful. Uh, they were both isolated. Emery changed formation to three at the back and they just realised they could get at Villa and then did so on repeat. And yeah, I thought Brennan Johnson was, was superb again, which is great for him. Son was was amazing. Kulisevsky was on fire. James Madison's back. They've just got so many attacking options. And then you've got these fullbacks or in Porro and Destiny Adoji who, who just fly forward and create extra space. And Villa just could not cope with it whatsoever. As you mentioned, John McGinn, I saw, I mean, Villa fans were really annoyed about the red card, but I mean, he does sort of Sunday league style, just run in the direction of a man and kick him. Like they're this sort of, it's just, he just completely lost his head and he walked straight off the pitch and was like, yeah, what have I done? He'll be out for three games because of that, which is big. And with England, you know, with the Premier League potentially not getting the fifth place into the Champions League if if teams continue to drop out of Europe Brighton style, then that could potentially be a playoff for the Champions League. And Spurs were com- you know, on ten times better than Villa in that second half. Hmm. The three games that McGinn will be absent for against West Ham, against Wolves and away at Man City. Yeah, and, and obviously that's coupled with uh, Kamara being out for the season. Um, I think there's there's suggestions that Jacob Ramsey might have suffered a, a, a fitness setback. Obviously, he's been out for a, for a while as well. They've they've got they've they've got shortcomings in midfield at the minute, and so that that red card could be um, could be important. And Villa's Villa's run whereby they had won I think fifteen home home game, league games in a row, and it's that momentum really falling apart. I, I was looking at the results. They only conceded seven goals across those 15 games. Amazing defensive record. And obviously we've talked about the high line before, but in the last six, they've not conceded 12. And that doesn't include the 3-1 home defeat against Chelsea in the FA Cup as well. So their home form's really dissipated uh, in, in that time frame. And the way things are with the momentum and Tottenham have that game in hand where they whereby they could go above Villa you could sort of think just with the, Tottenham's got players coming back Villa's got players dropping out so Tottenham you would imagine would be the likely team for the top four but Tottenham also have the key role to play in the title race because they've still to play City, Arsenal and Liverpool I think both teams have to face all, all three of them and uh, of the top three actually so a, a great a disastrous for Villa the, the joint heaviest home defeat that Unai Emery's Emery's ever had as a manager, but from Spurs, was this a return to Angeball? Uh, yeah, I'd say so. I think, uh, I mean, I termed this game the High Line Derby because both mm. have unbelievably brave high lines. I mean, you mentioned it with, with Villas, and I think that it can kind of work in two ways. Uh, I do want to come back to the Villa example, but for Spurs, having such a high line allows them to, what it always does is allow them to, to press really high. And that's what essentially what happened with. It would be the Brennan Johnson goal, and I know it was a bit of dawdling on the on the ball from Aston Villa, but the, the fact that they can squeeze the pitch allows them to keep the the ball really high and then swarm the opposition player and score and be in a position to score quite quickly after. And it was only a few seconds, wasn't it, after they regained the ball that Johnson went and scored. So I think Postecoglou, in that regard, will be very very pleased with that as well. And the fact that they exposed Aston Villa's high line was really intelligent as well, because what they would often do especially after the the sending off, which is, you know, a bit easier, obviously. But what they would do would get it wide and they would sort of stretch the pitch in, in wide areas and the high line from Aston Villa would pair back towards the six-yard box and they create that gap between the midfield and the defence. And then two cutbacks, essentially, were the, the killers for the goal, for the, I think, the third and the fourth. Um, and it was so intelligent and done from from Spurs. So they had, they had strength in their own high line to squeeze the pitch and they exposed Villa's high line by making them head towards their own goal and then pick them apart from uh, from the cutbacks. Nicely done. Nicely done. Uh, Villa have Ajax uh, at home on Thursday after the 0-0 in Amsterdam. I was just going to say, the, it, it, it's the first time I've seen James Madison since he's come back from injury. Mm. And what having him in the team changes things. It will require some tweaking from Postacoglu I'm sure he I think he's dropping a little bit too deep for Ange's liking at the moment but what it does do is it gives it kind of makes earlier in the season Madison was the active the obvious attacking threat the creative outlet at the moment what he's doing because they've learned in his absence to play this kind of um, dynamic sometimes counter-attacking football with Johnson one side and Kulisewski the other and the fullbacks running on it almost leaves Madison as a kind of surprise threat and you saw that for the goal he just wasn't he wasn't picked up because they were trying to watch the wingers and Madison was able to kind of seam through and get get the cross. So having, I think, less reliance on him 
is better. It might mean that his numbers look a little bit worse, but actually it means that he's when he's doing things, he's got more space, the game's more stretched wide, as Mark said, and he just looked like he was having a brilliant time annoying everyone at Villa Park because, you know, he's a he's an ex-Coventry player, he's an ex-Leicester player, they don't like him, and he did his kind of dart celebration towards the the whole end. And yeah, he enjoys his business when he's playing well, James Madison. Excellent. Lovely ball in as well from Papi Mata Saar. I thought that opening goal, Brandon Johnson with the second, then McGinn with the red card and late on. I think both goals after the after 90, uh, Young Min Son and then Timo Werner with, what, two in two games, is it? Two in two games. Mm. Still counts. Nice. <laughs> Villa anyway, their next game will be at home to Ajax, with whom they drew 0-0 last Thursday. Uh, other teams who are involved in the Europa League included Brighton who Daniel you mentioned them dropping out of Europe it's not it's not mathematical yet we've seen teams come back from a 4-0 first leg in the past didn't didn't Barcelona do that against PSG I think it was 4-0 the first leg anyway anyway it does look pretty favorable for Roma after that result at the Stadio Olimpico on Thursday uh this a 1-0 win for Brighton this weekend against Nottingham Forest yeah, I mean, Forest are on this run where they fans are sort of taking comfort from the fact that they're not getting thumped by any team, which is true, but they're also not beating any of them, really. Um, I, 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 Yeah, I, I mean, I, I saw the highlights of the game. Brighton, I think, finally look a little bit more pragmatic. Um, I, I think maybe Thursday night has made Roberto De Zerbi realise that he can't just kind of play this sort of sexy chaos football and talk his way into a, a big job. He's going to have to show something between now and May that he can organise the defence. They had Carlos Balaber and uh, Gr Pascal Gross next to each other in midfield. I think they've only done that like seven or eight times a season, but th the games they have played together, the only one they've lost is City away where they lost 2-1. So they just look a lot more firm in midfield with those two there. It is slightly less sexy without Matoma in the team and without players running everywhere, but it's probably better for Brighton, mm. I think. Duncan Alexander tweeting on Thursday night, I'm as worried about the coefficient as anyone, but Brighton getting smashed in an athletic stadium is a form of therapy for some bad away trips to the with Dean. Nice, nice. West Ham also didn't have a good result. Uh, last Thursday in the Europa League, they got beaten by Freiburg 1-0 away. They will be hosting the Germans this Thursday, of course. In the meantime, good Lord, they went two behind to Burnley. How did that happen? We're not entirely sure because it happened at two o'clock and wasn't on telly. True, but if you watch the goals, mm. please, please watch the first goal from Fafana. It is a postage stamp, top bins uh, finish from outside the box. It's a fantastic strike. And it, Burnley, I mean, I'm sure we'll come on to Sheffield United as well, but both Burnley and Sheffield United went 2 0 up in their respective games this weekend. Yet still, you felt that they were never going to win the game, which is just quite telling. And, you know, it happened, yeah, this afternoon, 2 0, 2 0 up in West Ham with a, a late equaliser in the end. But, um, yeah, a credit to, to West Ham. Uh, same with, with Brighton, the fact that they're playing on a Thursday with not too much to, to play for in the league, really. Um, aside from the fact that they do want to carry on, you know, going further in the Europa League, um, credit for, to both of them for getting granted West Ham didn't win but for both getting a result out of it. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if a lot of West Ham fans will be feeling as generous about their team's performance but it was nice to see Danny Ings score his first goal of the season and then a few minutes later score his first goal of the season <laughs> after the first one got ruled out. <laughs> it's remarkable, wasn't it? He hadn't scored all season, gets one, that's ruled out, scores another and then very nearly gets one which he, he volleys onto the, well, kind of the corner of the goal. Hmm. Anyway, Freiburg on Thursday for West Ham. <clears throat> West Ham, I do beg your pardon. Freiburg on Thursday, Daniel. Yeah, which is, is massive for the coefficient chat in terms of England getting five places in the Champions League next season. Why, which why is, is that a big one? Deal. Why is that one so massive? Because it, it, it's basically going to come down to Italy are doing very, very well and are in first place and they're almost certainly going to get their place. And at the moment, Germany are second and England are third. And obviously... Freiburg German club against West Ham English club mm. it's a kind of a big swing game in terms of the coefficient basically OK uh, on the Totally Football Show European edition we'll be discussing matters like those that'll be with you first thing on Tuesday looking ahead to not just the Thursday night Europa and Conference League action but a pretty special set of Champions League last 16 second legs unlike last week's last 16 second legs which were a bit 
bobbins. These look really potentially exciting. You've got Arsenal trying to come back from a goal down against Porto. Arsenal weren't all that exciting this weekend. Uh, we haven't touched on that yet, but we will. Porto are in a rich vein of form as we speak, although I haven't seen their result this weekend, Colin. No, well, Porto have just won, I've only won four of their last nine okay. away away games. Oh, really? Domest- okay. Domestically. So they um, they they beat Benfica 5-0 at home. Yeah. And I think they're on a run of not conceding in seven home games. That obviously included the Arsenal match. Right. So I think they're maybe a different proposition away. Um, but uh, Arsenal are almost, they're almost like uh, trying to be like Liverpool or Anfield with the Emirates stuff and trying to get that kind of emotional crowd element involved in those performances. I still think Arsenal will probably, um, probably just about go through okay. in that game. But um, obviously they, they went over Brentford mm. this weekend. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll get on to that yeah. next. Uh, just to mention the other Champions League games, Barcelona and Napoli, they're both, uh, it was 1-1 in the first leg. Wednesday, you got Dortmund PSV, which is also all square after the first match in uh, Holland. And Atletico Inter. Whoa, what a game. Anyway, we'll talk about all of that on Tuesday and Bayern beating Mainz 8-1 on Saturday. Guess who got a hat-trick? He's, he's now on 30 goals from 25 Bundesliga games, so he needs 12 from the remaining nine to take Lewandowski's single-season scoring record. And also, he needs one, one for his own personal record. He scored 30 twice for Tottenham in the Premier League, but he's going to break that almost certainly in a shorter league season in the Bundesliga. Incredible. Anyway, so it's going to be a bumper show on Tuesday, looking ahead to all of that. But Arsenal, Colin, yes. They got the win on Saturday against Brentford, but their free-scoring run came to a sudden end. Why? Uh, well, Brentford were were very much Brentford. Like Brent, Brentford, their team Arsenal maybe have, have struggled a little bit with. Um, I think I think as well. The thing with Brentford is a lot of a lot of fans still sort of perceive them as this nice little Brentford, like this tiny club who are just enjoying life in the Premier League. But they're actually really horrible to play against. This is a team who who get in your faces, who make things very uncomfortable, who try to wind up opposition players quite quite notably. I think sometimes that does work. Um, and you kind of think, whenever Arsenal took the lead, Declan Rice headed in from uh, Ben White's cross, you sort of thought, right, after 19 minutes, this is a little bit more of the same. And then that moment, just before halftime, when Aaron Ramsdale, obviously playing because David Raya um, couldn't play against Brentford, who's technically still his parent club, Ramsdale dallied on the ball and John Wiesa closed him down and scored a pretty remarkable goal. And kind of, I kind of think that moment it um, it ends the debate over Arsenal's number one goalkeeper. If there was a debate about that, I know Arteta has publicly come out and said it's between the two. It always has been all season, but I think David Raya is the superior goalkeeper. I think as well it shows that maybe when you are in Ramsdale's position of having mm. been a number one and then essentially being demoted his confidence clearly isn't high from that i mean that that that's probably the only explanation that you can look at from that error but i remember david ray used to make those kind of errors when he first got the the gig so there is a counter argument which is Ramsdale made this error because he hasn't been having the game time because he wasn't familiar with the pressure and, and timing of the, of the game at this this level. But I don't know. I mean, this season we've had a lot of Raya or Ramsdale chat. So uh, let's talk instead about Kai, uh, Kai Havertz, who ended the game with the Arsenal fans serenading him. What, what, what were they singing? I think the chant is 60 million down the drain, which is what people used to sing to him. Right. Kai Havertz has scored a game. Nice. Right? Or words to that effect, I think. OK. Uh, how many? It's four games in a row that he scored in in the Premier League. Yeah, and he he is. You know, I still don't. I'm still not sure if he's a a sixty million pound forward at the moment, but he's certainly playing a part in um, in big moments again. Mm. We should say that the, the basically the two goals he scored for Arsenal that were real game changing moments have both come against Brentford. One in a one nil away win, and one in. This game, uh, he scored the other three goals recently have come in kind of 4-0, 5-0, 6-0 wins. Um, but he is he is a presence in the team. He looks more confident. I think the su- the superstar from this game was, and also a much improved player was Ben White. Who, hmm. You know, he was bought as a £50 million centre-back and he's turned into a sort of £65 million right-back, which is a pretty decent effort over two and a bit years or three years. It very much is. And he's 
he's kind of embodying that change by becoming more and more Latino in appearance uh, <laughs> w with every appearance. Uh, Kai Havertz, just to mention, the Brentford very much the opinion that he shouldn't have been on the field to score that winning goal. What did you think? Yeah, I, I thought the first yellow card that he got was kind of a 50-50 anyway. Mm. So, well, he didn't get the other yellow card. Yeah, so yeah. I almost think that he, on, on in the aggregate, I think he's okay. probably one yellow card up, probably rather than then getting the the second one. Okay, which was for a, a pretty. I mean, it was manifestly a, a dive. Yeah. If we're talking about aggregates, I guess Arsenal fans would say Trossard should have had a penalty. So the fact that Havertz tried to get one and didn't, but stayed on the field and. Yeah, yeah, it all it all Overall, evens out. I think so. I think the th other thing I'd say on on Habits is that he feels a little bit sometimes like the the talk around Darwin Nunes, where he seems like you know if he's put through on goal, you think okay, it's just fairly easy for you to go and finish now, and then he goes and misses it. There was one where Jorginho put a fantastic ball through, and he was through one on one, didn't even hit the target, and then he goes and gets a, a well taken header as well, and you think okay, this is your chance, and it's it's happened before, yeah, where he scored the the winner against Brentford at Brentford and you think this is your chance to kick on and gain some confidence but uh, he, he hasn't quite built up as much consistency but in recent weeks he, he seems to have done that and I think that he's widely regarded as doing so so well off the ball his wider contribution towards the attack as well a bit like Gabriel Jesus as well in that regard is is what's key to keeping him in the side. So there was the debate when he first joined about how he should be used by Arteta and the feeling is now that Arteta's found the right role for him. What exactly is it that he does in the team? Well, again, it probably depends on the the situation, the opposition, different times, because he is sometimes a victim of his own versatility, uh, I'd say, because we know that he can play as a, as a number eight. He can play as a false nine, which he did pretty well at, at Chelsea. And I'd say historically, from his time at Bayer Leverkusen, which I realise is going back quite some time now, his best position is kind of a, a box crashing number 10 and arriving onto to crosses and cutbacks. And that is kind of how he scored the goal this, this weekend. So I think, you know, arriving onto the play with not having to think all that much and not necessarily having to be the, the spearheading number nine um, is where he is best. And I think that that is probably where you take a little bit of the the, the focus off him, a bit more of the, um, a bit less of the onus on him and he goes and sort of thrives a little bit more, I'd say. And and that Havertz almost sort of typifies what what a lot of Arsenal players are not really having that defined role right in 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 the team and he sort of does pop up in different places and it's the same with Declan Rice who's now turned into this massive goal threat and it's essentially it's because of runs from deep that aren't that aren't being tracked and they're hard to track because their starting positions in the match are sometimes a little bit different and it's it, so they're difficult to mark and even with Ben White finding so much time twice in that position of the pitch to to get in the cross which which ultimately lead to the goal so I think it is clear that Arsenal's tactics under Arteta probably evolve um really quite frequently even within games themselves and it's very hard to sort of combat that and I guess that's why you do get different players coming up in the big moments and even without maybe a recognised sort of 25, 30 goal a season striker, they're still managing to score so many goals. Indeed. And with both of them as well, it was it was Rice and Havertz, both summer signings, both six foot four-ish themselves. I think there's, it's not by coincidence that Mikel Arteta, similar to Pep Guardiola, has invested in a steeliness, a robustness, a strength, really making sure they get, they've got that height. And mm. uh, Havertz's goal was the 16th headed goal that Arsenal have scored this season. And that's more comfortably, more than any of the Premier League side this season. And even if you account for the fact that Arsenal have scored a lot more goals than other sides, even as a share of their total, I think they're still the, the third or fourth highest. So, you know, aerial dominance and height and, and real power is a key part of, of Arsenal this season. And set pieces have been a key part of that, I get it. But both those goals this weekend were from open play as well. So. They, they really do have strength in the air, I'd say. Very nice. Uh, Porto on Tuesday, you're going to be going along to that, Mark? Yes. Yeah, really looking forward to it because mm. Arsenal were, they were just horseshoeing it around so much. They didn't penetrate uh, Porto's mid-block the whole time in, in that first leg. So I'm really looking forward to seeing whether Arsenal actually do take the game to, to Porto a little bit more. They were okay. far too careful last, in the first leg. OK. Brentford have now lost 13 of the last 17 Premier League matches. They are five points off the drop. Situation down there at the bottom, quite fluid. We might get on to some of the reasons for that next. Latest club rumoured to have fallen foul of PSR, Profit and Sustainability Rules, are Leicester. Leicester, the Championship leaders. 
Reportedly, they need to make big sales in the summer or they too could breach PSR and start next season with a points deduction. This is a bit controversial. The points deduction would come next season, by which time they could be promoted and then would start in the Premier League with a handicap. Sounds like fun. <laughs> Daniel, what can you tell us? You're in the neighbouring county. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can just see over the border, look over the wall. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's as, it's as messy as that sounds. You've got a club who have already failed for the last period, but effectively the EFL are not able to administer the punishment because it's a Premier League uh, rules that they've missed. And it sounds like they are in grave danger unless they sell more players before June the 30th. Um, and why any clubs would bother offering for those players before June the 30th, I don't know, um, of... of falling foul again and I you know there must be other clubs as well you know I was just looking kind of shooting the breeze through it and there are a number of clubs I won't mention any names because there's no proof but there are a number of clubs who have spent considerable money since promotion or have not sold many players since relegation who must I can only think if Leicester in big trouble then they must be in big trouble and it is getting very messy it is weird that Leicester's punishment will apply next season but Forest and Everton's will apply this season and last season you had Forest saying we want Everton's to apply so that Forest were campaigning for Everton's to apply last season it applies this season it's so messy at the moment and it will only get more messy as more and more clubs have issues and yeah as you kind of alluded to earlier James we're going to find out sooner rather than later Forest punishment so it might be this week yeah, I mean, my, my, my kind of gut hunch, and it is just that, is that it will be the same six points that Everton eventually got. I don't see enough material reasons why it would be different. It, it could be, obviously, Everton was initially 10 and then it was reduced to six. Mm. And within the sort of written reasons of, of why the, the, the punishment was six points, it seemed to be that if this happens, the the, the scope would be between six and nine points for this offence. So it'll be a minimum of six, mm. uh, we think. But mm -hmm. I think the Nottingham Four situation and the Everton situation was a little bit different in terms of in terms of which club owned up to sort of which offences and which club like actually we you know we we weren't responsible for that. And I mean I, I know I know Daniel's tried to explain it there. It, it's so complicated and so convoluted, especially with lesser situation but then the EFL and not the Premier League and will they get promoted or will they right. not get promoted. But in terms of Forest uh, I think the, the punishment is expected this month, definitely. Month. And I guess that uncertainty over, over when it will be and how many points it will be obviously has a material impact on all those teams around them, especially Luton Town, who, who are within what, what one result of, of, of leapfrobbing them and the, and the safety. So, I mean, this has, been, this has been said all along and it's nothing new, but I think we need clarity as soon as possible just to have this and, and to know what the situation in the picture is. It's difficult, though, because, yeah. uh, I mean, I think as we said before, uh, the people in charge of this aren't the people who broke the regulation. So if we have the regulations which the clubs voted for, you'd expect them to act fairly in terms of their decisions, and that's going to require time. I mean, you, you've got to go through Lord knows how many documents. So I, I can see why it takes time, but equally, as you say, it's going to have a material impact on everybody. Uh, Daniel? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, Colin mentions Luton and Forest, and it's Luton versus Forest <laughs> this weekend. And you've got a situation whereby... It's 10 minutes to go and it's nil-nil and you're both clubs, but I feel particularly sorry for Luton because they've done nothing wrong. And they think, well, do we need to go for a, you know, to, if Forest only get a three-point deduction, we probably need to go for this. If Forest are going to get six points, then we're happy with a draw because we'd be three points ahead of them. And that, that, that lack of certainty around it is really, really messy and it doesn't help anyone. I agree with you, James. I don't, I don't actually think there's a way around it until clubs stop failing it or the rules change. And one of those things probably has to happen. But... Um, yeah, at the moment, it's just this kind of weird hinterland where, yes, obviously you you want to win a game, whatever happens, but it's a serious consideration for Luton. You don't throw players forward with five minutes to go and if you don't need to win the game, and they might need to win the game or they might not. And, yeah, it's it's a mess. This is so far out of my wheelhouse, I've got to say, but is, it, is there a situation that I read whereby it could even extend beyond the season. Mm. So there could be the final formation, the final league table, and still there could be changes. So no one can celebrate yeah. or even plan for the following season. It's like VAR when you score a goal, no? Yeah. yeah. At the season level. Potentially. It's yeah, imagine that. Imagine the joy of a double celebration if you stay up and then win your court case. Wow. Like the romance is just You'll never sing that. amazing. <laughs> Who face Forest, as you point out, next weekend. Three points... Currently behind 
uh, Nuno uh, Espirito Santo's side, but with a game in hand. Mm. Anyway, oh, speaking of things in the championship, we haven't had much Watford changing managers chat of late. But they suddenly woke up and binned their boss on Saturday. Valerian Ismail sacked. Who's the new fella? Oh, God. Tom Cleverly. Yeah, mm. Tom, does everyone feel 12 yes. years older than they already did Cleverly? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Excellent. He'll be the 11th manager to sit in the home dugout at Vicarage Road since 2020. Surely that's a misprint. Was it now? 2024? Yeah. Yeah, that's it extraordinary. must be more than that. No, 11 yeah. managers. <laughs> Wow. Uh, anyway, all right. Uh, one of the teams involved in all that PSR fun is, of course, Everton. This weekend, they went to Old Trafford. Didn't do badly, but still came away with a 2-0 defeat. Huh. Two first-half penalties, both won by Garnacho. And that was that. Did What happened to Everton here? Did they maybe create loads of chances but fail to finish any of them properly the, the thing for me is I know that it's been spoken about on this podcast before in terms of the... It's in my wheelhouse now, mm. the expected goals ah. and, and the difference between goals yeah. scored and expected goals and all that. And all that is true. I think they still are the, the most underperforming side in that regard. But one thing that struck me from this weekend was that it's not even the chances that they get. It's the further along the attacking chain, along the sequence where... It's the pass that doesn't happen when it when it could and the attack breaks down. It's when they are in the box and they, they flash it across and the, or, or the cross itself is of low quality and they don't even get the shot away. It's the fact that they get into good areas and potentially don't even take the shot. So if you account for those as well as the shots that they do miss, um, it, it doesn't quite look that, that strong, that positive. I, when you just do it on the shots alone, it's pretty uh, remarkable. <laughs> In the two meetings with Man United this season, they had 47 shots and f failed to score a single goal. United had 23 and scored five. Daniel? Yeah, I had a question for Mark, given our XG expert resident is in. I, this might be completely wrong, but my theory on Everton is that they're basically not very good at taking low to mid-level chances. So they have mm. loads and loads and loads of shots. They've had more shots than like Newcastle, for example. And... They miss lots of them because they're all sort of mid to low level. I don't really see them creating kind of golden, golden, golden chances, kind of which I guess would like register an XG as sort of like 0 0.4 or above mm. or something. I, and I wouldn't. I, I know Dice keeps going on and like, oh, they need to want it more. They need to finish their chances more. It's like you know, woe is me, woe is us. But actually, maybe. Maybe he needs to change the style of play. Maybe having like a David Moyes style, we're not going to have that many shots, but the ones we have are going to be really high value, is better than having 47 shots and not scoring it from any of them. Because I don't think they had a, a golden chance against Manchester United. They had chances where you'd be like, oh, that's annoying, he's missed that. But not like, how did he not score that chance? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I think that's, that's the, the crux of expected goals, whereby it's about quality and, and not necessarily quantity you can have all of those shots that James mentioned and they could be all very low quality and you're just slowly accruing a, a lot of they're not even half chances are they very very low quality chances or you could have one shot that is you know in the six yard box and that's more likely to, to go in I think it is all about quality rather than quantity if you can get high quality and high quantity then you are pushing for the, for the league title so I think it, it definitely is that I think with Everton as well with, with XG and, and underperforming against your XG you can put it down to so many different things in in the short to medium term you could put it down to a bit of bad finishing a bit of bad luck um, or sometimes good opposition goalkeeping or defending you've got to give the credit to to someone else there like Onana for example yeah on Saturday yeah, yeah. If, in some instances and I think that well what I do think is that with Calvert-Lewin in particular, but quite a few Everton players, is that I think it's probably the the former. I think that there is some really poor finishing in there as well, which I, I, I won't go too much into the numbers, but I had a look at it recently and it does seem, it does seem to be that you can localise it to quite a lot of poor finishing at times. They've got but, bad goal scorers at Everton. Yeah, so expected goals is essentially the, the quality of the chance before the shot is taken. Dominic Calvert-Lewin actually takes off quality 
after the shot is taken. Eight. So you can actually, there's a, there's a measure called expected goals on target as well, which looks to see what the quality of the, the shot is in terms of how it, where it's placed in the goal mouth. If right. it's in the top corner, it's going to add value to the, to the shot and the position of the shot. If it's trickling along towards the center of the goal, then it's going to take quality off the shot. And Calvert-Lewin does seem to take a bit of quality off the shot. So his mm. shot placement and his shot accuracy, I suppose, and shot conversion by um, by proxy is is quite weak. So okay. it shows that he's actually but not. Who's the worst well. at that in the league? I don't have the numbers to hand um, on me. If you invite me back on, I will, <laughs> okay. uh, I will come and <laughs> do right. a segment. What's that metric that. again? Expected goals on target. That's the post-shot expected goals. You got. X X G O T X. Oh yeah, right. X yeah, yeah. X G O T. <laughs> and a lot of this, a lot of this was said about Graham Potter's teams, wasn't it? Especially at Brighton, and then that yeah. almost carries through to Chelsea, where it was like, actually, when you look at them play, they they seem to create quite a lot and they have chances. But is there actually like a structural issue with maybe it are, are the attacks done in a way, maybe in terms of the the pace, the directness of it, that make it slightly easier for defenses to adjust to maybe block them out, like, and and. For this game, Ever Everton have a lot of shots. Man United always concede a lot of shots. I think that can be slight. I mean, obviously, that's, that's really not a good thing. I mean, it's, there's far too many. I think only Sheffield United have conceded more in the Premier League this season. But Manchester United play with quite a deep defence, especially when Johnny Evans, who's 36 and is having to play three injuries, they cannot play a high line. So what that means is that there's a big, big gap between defence and midfield. So there's a lot of shots from maybe the edge of the area or just outside the area. So there's a lot of low-quality xg being created and so i think the short statistics is maybe a little bit uh misleading in in that sense and watching this game it never really felt like everton once it went to 2-0 you just you, there was no conviction whatsoever that they were going to really get back into that game i think if anything united maybe had the more dangerous isolated attacks mm -hmm. um but i mean when man united had so many players aren't injured for that match and you just sort of thought everton they started quite brightly and then they just lacked conviction. And that's been the the, the case for so many weeks. They lost uh, two points at the last minute against Brighton. Obviously, that Lewis Dunkheader. And that was against 10 men. They really should have seen that out as a victory. And then, of course, uh, last time out at home to West Ham, they should have probably been ahead in that match. It was 1-1 and they can see twice in the last minute again. I think it's a team that is maybe starting to lack the, the sort of self-belief and what it's doing. And again, that sort of helps the XG and maybe helps Gisbane, maybe why there's rushed finishing or just a lack of conviction. And the other um, acronym du jour, uh, PSR, might be playing a, a role in that as well because yeah. they're another team un affected by this uncertainty with another yeah. ruling hanging over their heads. The, the, reason, the, the reason it's kind of maddening to me is that I'm pretty sure, and again, Mark will know more than this, about this and me and Colin almost certainly will as well, but I'm pretty sure Sean Dyche is Burnley. Their whole aim was to basically concede quite a lot of shots, but from really bad areas, so that it generated this kind of cumulative XG that looked quite bad, but basically what they were shooting from, they were blocking shots all the time and they were taking them from out wide and they were forcing crosses into the box that they head away. And yet Sean Dyche's Everton just have James Tarkovsky smashing it for, to a winger who then crosses the box for a very low XG-headed chance. And it's like, I just, yeah, I just, I don't get that. It, that seems completely illogical to me. I don't get the don't get the sense in doing what you used to do as an, you thought at your old club was a bad way of attacking. Mm. Well, it's 11 Premier League matches without a win for Everton. They have three game, uh, sorry, three weeks now without a game. I'm not sure if they're heading off a warm weather training or if their finances perhaps don't stretch to that. Wolves 2, Fulham 1, which Gary O'Neill, Wolves manager, called his favourite win as a Wolves manager given their injury crisis. Yeah, this this uh, game, Fulham, I don't know how Fulham ended up 2-0 down. Obviously, they lost 2-1. They got to go back at the very, very end. But they missed so many chances. I mean, talking about talking about shots on goal, they had 23. And quite a lot of them were actually high-quality chances. They missed, I think it was um, uh, Wilson missed a one-on-one. -on -one. They hit the post. They had other chances that they really should have done better with. And, uh, and they received by Jose Sa. And what was actually striking from a Fulham point of view was that Joao Polina wasn't in the eleven. I I don't know why that was. Mm. Um, obviously he he had been been out suspended and then he's come back in and he wasn't playing. But Fulham played well, but Wolves had so many absences and this was all about 
Wolves getting a result and they lost two more players um, in this game as well one of which was Pedro Neto who had come off the previous week with a hamstring injury and came off this week again with another hamstring injury in the same muscle and Gary O'Neill was speaking after the match and he said like we'd, we'd done all the analysis all the tests all the training and he was fine but then obviously the injury reoccurs again and he's such a key player for them especially with Matthias Cunha out and, and Huang out as well they've, they've really got a lot of attacking absentees but the fact that they're still managing to get these sort of results and they're still in the top half of the table, it obviously reflects very well on Gary O'Neill. But I think in this game itself, it was as much to do with Fulham's um, lack of efficiency in the final third. Yeah, profligacy, I, I agree. I think that Wolves' main threat this season, which is why they've been doing so well, is that they've been a real strong counter-attacking threat. And that comes from having such explosive, fast players and the players that you listed who are now out or currently out um you know take that attacking threat away i think that ryan ate nori the mm. wolves's left back went to, to play right wing and was a revelation which i thought was uh, maybe a, a new role for him the, the fact that he's got such quick feet he's a really technical player at the best of times that that could potentially unlock a, a new attacking threat for wolves there because they're going to have to find solutions given how many uh, injuries they have indeed sorry if we've not left a huge amount of time for these but bournemouth 2-2 with sheffield united Crystal Palace 1-1 with Luton. And, uh, yeah, that was it. Then the other game is Chelsea-Newcastle, which takes place on Monday. Key thing from uh, the Crystal Palace-Luton game, surely Mike Dean on Sky questioning Premier League debut, debutant referee Sonny St. Gill's uh, decision to sign autographs at half-time, says Mike Dean about the young referee in his first time yeah. and the... Top level. Maybe when you're warming up before the game, do it, but not at half time when you've got a game to do. It's just bang out of order. Of course, Mike Dean was always about keeping a low profile and he knows what's out of order. It's certainly not when you fail to correct a mistake that you've spotted when you're a VAR official because your mate, Anthony Taylor, is the referee and you don't want to give him oh. extra grief. It's not like that ever it's happened to Mike that... Dean. Oh, that all reminds me. I just I'm crying with that here because it's just reminding me of a line in Jeff Winter's autobiography, former referee, Premier League referee Jeff Winter, where he said his final ever game, Premier League game, was at Anfield, and he said I played a bit of extra time, waiting until the play was at the cop end before sounding the final whistle. I'm reading it now. This is not me. I've not learnt it. I should <laughs> clarify that. The fans behind the goal burst into spontaneous applause. It was longer and louder than normal, even for a big home win. Did they know it was my final visit there? Was it applause for me? They're such knowledgeable football people, it wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> and that just, I just, amazing. All right, Daniel. So, yeah, I mean. Your audio book, uh, I hope anyway, it yeah. works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, anyway, yeah. Good, good, good performance in Bournemouth, well played. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, that's so funny. So, uh, Palace Luton, that was settled, uh, well, it, it saw the uh, equaliser from Luton in the 96th minute. Remarkable. Uh, the 20th time, that is, that Palace have conceded in the last 15 minutes of games this season. Colin? Yeah, uh, on Luton. Uh, I know Mark was giving him a little bit of, of love earlier, but I think one of the reasons you want Luton to stay in the league is it they're actually quite a fun team to watch and this, this is the 15th game in a row that they've scored mm. in the Premier League and they've only failed to score four Premier League games this season that's that's just a remarkable start considering the fact that their investment is considerably lower than pretty much any other club um, and Colly Woodrow um, getting his first Premier League goal in 10 years I think. Mm. and his last one um, as Crystal Palace fans probably will be aware was also against them also an equaliser for Felix Magat's film yeah. in 2014 oh, was it? yeah, yeah. Wow. so this is uh, so this is really this is really going back he's had um, he's had a bit of a well, I wouldn't say a journeyman career but I definitely wouldn't have thought he was um he probably wouldn't have thought he was going to be back scoring goals in the Premier League. And, and there he was. It was a really important moment for Luton, who are obviously still in the chance. But yeah, Palace have conceded 10 goals in the 90th minute or later this season. They, they just seem to keep throwing away advantages. And again, mm. in this match, chance after chance, that they, I mean, they, should, they should have been winning this by maybe three or four goals. And again, it's just, <laughs> we keep going back to teams who aren't, who aren't taking their chances. And this, this was another. Mm. They will head off to Spain uh, with... Oliver Glasner to try and get their heads straight for their return to action in three weeks' time. In the meanwhile, Luton have a Premier League fixture coming up midweek, which sees them pitted against Bournemouth. If they win that, 
They'll be out of the bottom three and... Well, we won't talk about who might be in it, but let's talk about the team that they'll be facing midweek then. Bournemouth, who went two goals down to Sheffield United. This was a real surprise, given what has been going on with the Blades of late. But I guess what's been going on with the Cherries of late hasn't been that great either. No, and it could have got a lot worse in terms of uh, Dominic Slanky missing that that penalty. You don't see too many players slipping. Rather than you know, just simply missing, he just completely stacked it. Um so it could have been a lot worse as well. I think that, I mean, to, to get back into it, you've got to give them credit, Bournemouth, haven't you? I think that as much as Bournemouth were good to get back into it, that set piece at the very end, I, I just look at some of the marking for Sheffield United and you just think that's championship level marking, that's relegation form marking. It was the, it was the Ben uh, Britton Diaz one where he, he was just at the, the near post. His, his job was to stay pretty much level with the near post, don't really leave the six-yard box. And he just completely, I, get, I think, just missed the flight of the ball and just wandered into no man's land. The ball just came straight over the, the top of him and, and they go and um, Bournemouth go and score as a consequence. And yeah, as much as you can give credit to Bournemouth, that was just so naive from Sheffield United, I'd he, say. Yeah, and Bournemouth's first goal, Leo Tara header, he was just completely unmarked yeah. right in front of goal. And again, you just can't do that. But like, yeah, Solanke's missed penalty and then Solanke did score uh, yeah. when the score was a 2-0 and it was correctly ruled out for handball but it was it's very, it was a very very unfortunate so this this could really have been a lot worse for Sheffield United as Mark says and like, I mean obviously going 2-0 up away to Bournemouth is an improvement on getting beat 6-0 and their, their, their home form which is really really quite dreadful but they're, 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 this just isn't a Premier League team and um, I know Chris Wilder spoke after the match about um, people were, were, were writing them off as the worst mm. team in Premier League history, and mm. at the time Who, they who's been doing that? I wonder. Well, <laughs> I, I wonder. I wonder which outlets he has been uh, reading in the media this past week. Oh. Um, but uh, yeah, she, I mean, like Sheffield United are are, are a championship team, and I think I think Chris Wilder as well. It's really I actually think it's really interesting. Whenever Sheffield United went up in 2019, he was viewed as a sort of tactical revolutionary, almost in terms of this asymmetric fullback. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and then overlapping central back, center defenders, and and this was like, oh, this is a really exciting team. And then they finished in the top half comfortably, mm. and uh, despite everyone predicting they were going to go down. And if so, like Chris Wilder was viewed as a real manager of the year contender. Um, but everything that has happened since for him hasn't gone particularly well. Um, I don't, I don't know why, but um, obviously the, the Sheffield United team just, 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 just aren't up to the level of, of being a Premier League team, unfortunately. All right, well. All three of the bottom three getting a point this weekend, as we mentioned. We'll see what happens on one, on Monday night as Chelsea take on Newcastle. But in the meantime, that's it for match day 28 of the season. Many thanks to Daniel. Hope you enjoy your week. Mark, your trip to the Emirates to Looking forward to watch Arsenal against Porto. And Connor, whatever it is, what are you up to this week? I am going off to Germany later Ooh. in the week. I'm going to see some uh, German football over, over the weekend. Nice. Enough, so yeah, All right. To. Excellent. And you, listener, whatever it is you've got in store, I hope it's a splendid and that it leaves you enough time to catch up with us on Tuesday when the Euro crew are back to preview all the Euro action and that. For now, from all of us here, though, it's goodbye. The Totally Football Show podcast is available three times a week, bringing you all the football news you could reasonably be expected to care about. We've got views, we've got stats, we've got analysis, we've got some of the best football writers around and the whole thing is absolutely free. So have a listen on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or all the usual places by clicking on the link below.